G'day and welcome to Pello Talk. I'm Dave Pello. My guest today is Stephen Shavira, Dr. Stephen Shavira. Stephen Shavira holds a PhD in the history of early modern English political thought. He has published in journals such as the History of European Ideas, the Journal of Religious History, and the Australian Journal of Political Science. What I'm wanting to talk to Dr. Stephen Shavira about today is his part in the Australian Research Council team, which is working on the emergence and development of political secularity in Australia, basically the concept of church and state. His research includes the history of political thought, church and state in history, modern political philosophy, recognition theory, and freedom of speech. Welcome to the show, Dr. Stephen Shavira. Thanks for having me, David. It's great to be here. My pleasure. It's uh, been something I've been trying to do all year long. You're an incredibly uh, well qualified and notable guest, but you're uh, at least equally as busy. So thank you for uh, the the honor of uh, making the time and and coming on the show. Pleasure. Now, tell me about your research um, into uh, political secularity. In Australia, perhaps you can even start by defining that word for me. What does secular mean, and, and is there only one definition of it? Ah, well, I mean, see, that's the big question that uh, my research team and I are trying to answer. Uh, you may remember that during the Howard years, there was a period towards the end of Howard's um, uh, government where there was a lot of talk about the intersection of church and state. And you had uh, some very um, influential articles and, and books written. Uh, one of the very well-known ones was uh, God Under Howard by uh, Marion Maddox. And there were all these accusations against the Howard government that it was sort of breaching a separation of church and state that had always been honored in Australia. And they said that he'd been doing this by sort of outsourcing social services to faith-based uh, institutions and things like that. And, you know, also accusations later on against Tony Abbott for his stance against uh, uh, abortifacent pills and things like that, yep. arguing that Tony Abbott is bringing his religion into politics and that's a breach of Australia's secular state. And so I started asking myself, well, what is a secular state? And I soon realized that in actual fact, the term doesn't really have a particularly well-defined meaning And it's something that political secularity is something that's done quite differently from country to country. And so Mm. I was sort of trying to answer this question as a political theorist. And then I eventually found out that I actually had to become a historian. And so I wound up going into the archives of Australian history and looking for all sorts of books and articles and, and, and pamphlets that were written during the colonial period. Uh, which may have spoken about a concept such as the secular state, secularism, the separation of church and state. And what I found is that uh, Australia does have a fairly distinct tradition of political secularity and a separation of church and state, but it's nothing really like uh, the claims being made for those terms by sort of modern day secularists. And so classic examples of what I discovered were sort of the misuse of the word secular uh, when modern sort of modern secularists say things like, well, we shouldn't have any scripture teaching in schools uh, because we have a secular education system. And I'll possibly point to the Victorian 1872 Free Compulsory and and Secular Education Act, Mm -hmm. or they'll point to the New South Wales 1880 uh, education Act, and so they'll say, well, you see, in those laws, it, t- it says that we have a secular education system. And what I and my colleagues discovered, and something that out the, some, many of the best historians have already said or hinted at in the past, uh, is that in actual fact that in the 19th century, the dominant meaning of secular in Australia was not sort of the absence of religion. Mm. It was the absence of sectarian, dogmatic uh, exclusively doctrinal religion. So and it's concept- almost, almost like it, non-denominational. Well, non-denominational and, and, in, in, and in many instances really sort of counterintuitively to the modern mindset, what mm. secular actually meant was Christian. 
Now, you know, there's more to be said about that because... Wow, that, that's almost the opposite of the modern interpretation. Well, it, it is in many ways. And, and the, other, the other interesting part of our study is to track exactly what, you know, how the conception of the secular, the dominant conception of the secular in Australia uh, went from being sort of general Christianity to what it often is now, which is a realm utterly devoid of Christianity in any religion, a sort of religionless realm, or what Charles Taylor would call uh, secularism as the subtraction of religion. And so what we're trying to figure out in our book uh, is how that happened. And that's a very interesting story. And uh, it's just one of those instances where uh, you, you realize how the words that we use, like secular and, and, mm. and separation of church and state, the meaning given to them uh, is something uh, that's very much uh, culturally conditioned and culturally situated. I um I haven't read your book and I'm really keen to I'm fascinated by this topic and and actually wanting to to really promote a better deeper understanding of it because truth is somewhat relevant to everybody's life um, but if I was to take a guess I'd say what's distorted our understanding of it to almost now be the opposite is how the word has been used internationally, not so much in Australia. So, for example, France's secular state is is aggressively exclusive of religion, where you, you can't even yeah. wear a cross around your neck if you're a teacher in a public school. And yes. uh, we're obviously very familiar with um, America's interpretation of of the the separation of church and state, which yes. has has become. Uh, interpretive rather than faithful to the original intent and and now is almost religious in its rejection of anything to do with God as opposed to neutral. Um, and so I, my guess is, you know, is that close? What's your research? Is it, oh, uh, well, I don't want you to offer any spoilers for the book, but... Uh, no, how, no, no, that, that's, that's a very good point that you raised, Dave. I mean, and and it shows again the importance of understanding history in order to understand these these concepts like secular. Uh, so in the, the, the tradition of, of French secularism or what they would call laicity, uh, what what becomes very important is understanding the French Revolution. And sort of the modern mm. France was born with the French Revolution, mm. and the French Revolution itself was a reaction. Uh, in, in many ways against two things. It was a reaction against an, an un, a largely unreformed medieval Catholic church and a largely unreformed absolute monarchy. And so when the French Revolution happened in 1789, uh, it took on a very sort of anti-religious flavor uh, because, you know, unlike in countries like, like England, uh, the church had not been reformed um, and the monarchy and the, the, the power of the monarchy had not been softened. And so in the, in the spirit of the, of the France that emerged from the, uh, the, um, the uh, French Revolution, yep. there was a strong anti-religious sentiment. And consequently, French secularism uh, was a secularism that sought to contain the influence of religion and to very much control religion uh, by the state. Um, and that's mainly because in sort of French revolution mythology, religion, uh, certainly Christianity, is seen as something very dangerous, seen as something mm. that's quite superstitious and something that needs to be controlled. And so that's why the French church-state relationship is the way that it is. Now, the American case is, is very interesting. Because, as you say, sort of American secularism uh, has, at least at the judicial level, uh, taken on a, a fairly, uh, a fairly anti-religious um, flavour to it, yeah, seeking definitely. to sort of remove religion from public institutions, especially in most controversially schools. But as you also hinted at earlier, Dave, it wasn't always that way. And pretty much all uh, historians uh, uh, and legal uh, historians of American church-state relations will say uh, 
that the sort of anti-religious secularism in America, and particularly in, in the Supreme Court, uh, that really begins after World War II, uh, more specifically in, in 1947. Mm. And... And, and that was in many ways a departure from earlier American understandings of the separation of church and state and the notion of a secular state, which was actually very similar to the Australian understanding. The, 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 the notion of a secular state in America and even secular education basically meant uh, general Christian education that all, uh, whether you were Protestant or Catholic, could attend. Now, in actual fact, uh, what we also know right. is that there was a very Protestant anti-Catholic bias in all, of, in all of this. But the point remains that even in America, up until uh, World War II, the word secular and the term separation of church and state did not have the anti-religion connotation which it currently has. And that's what uh, history teaches us. So, and that's why it's important to really have some understanding of Australian history in particular, because... Australian history is invoked so badly by many modern day secularists who sort of say, well, you know, look, um, you know, in the colonial period, people said, uh, you know, Australia had a secular system of education. There were people who said Australia was a secular state. Therefore, the more, you know, we allow education in schools, the more we fund public schooling, we're sort of deviating away from a secular ideal of the colonial period. But if you don't understand that these, the notion of secularity in the colonial period was not the absence of religion, but the presence of non-sectarian, non-doctrinal Christian religion, then the argument that we ought to get rid of religion in schools and we ought to defund schools uh, based on uh, the notion that we were secular in the colonial period, it totally falls flat. It becomes completely invalid. It's based on historical illiteracy. I'd love to uh, facilitate a debate between you and a aggressive secularist um, who, who, who wanted to exclude Christianity, faith, and, and uh, spiritual worldviews from political realms and debates. It would be fascinating to, to see their objections and, and your rebuttals. Um, but uh, tell me more about the influence or, or the lack thereof um, that you've come to be aware of through your research of Christianity and religion in our own constitution, our own constitutional convention and, and founding fathers. How much of an influence um, does Christianity have? I'm aware that Christian, we're not a Christian nation. There's no official state religion. But culturally, uh, those who created our laws and our, our constitution, did they envisage a Christian culture uh, were they deeply spiritual themselves, notionally spiritual, or completely atheistic? What what was the flavour of of the nation that they were trying to build and um, codify a uh, hundred plus years ago? It's a great question. Um, look, the overwhelming majority of the the uh, federation uh, delegates in, in the uh, federation conventions in the eighteen nineties identified as Christian. Uh, the overwhelming majority of those being Protestant Christian. Uh, and certainly they believed that in some way they were making a constitution for a country that did have a particular character. And its character was British. And therefore, because it was British, it was Christian. And more particularly, it was Protestant, although they wouldn't have explicitly come out and said it was Protestant because that would have mm. caused all sorts of problems with Catholics. But certainly in the minds of the Federation Fathers, the Australian nation was not a blank slate. Uh, the Australians are identifying as Christians in the early 19th, in the early uh, 20th century, in the late 19th century was in the high 90s. Wow. The very fact that you have section 116 in the Australian Constitution, which guarantees sort of freedom from the state coercion of religion, uh, is because it was feared that if the Constitution was going to mention God in the preamble, which it does, mm -hmm. then what, you would, what would happen is that Australian judges and politicians and, and, you know, and, and, and others would start seizing on the notion that Australia is a Christian nation in order to pass uh, laws that may restrict 
uh, uh, Sabbath that, 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 that may, sorry, compel Sabbath observance. Mm -hmm. And that was something that was a great worry to some religionists in particular. That was a, that was a specific fear they had? It was a specific fear that the Seventh-day Adventists had, okay. and this was something that was taken very seriously uh, by uh, some of the uh, delegates, uh, uh, Henry Higgins in particular. But, but the point is that undergirding that fear was the general knowledge that Australians were a very Christian people, and that it wasn't out of the question that in actual fact, if God was mentioned in the Constitution, then Australians would push for laws at the federal level to ban trade on Sundays. You could only have that fear if you believed that at the popular national grassroots level, Australians were deeply Christian. And the fact is that they were. And this was something acknowledged by several of the delegates, most famously Patrick McMahon Glynn, who was the one who argued in favour of the actual uh, uh, inclusion of God in the preamble. Yep. Now, as you probably know, when that was first debated, it was defeated. Uh, and the delegates were sort of thinking that that would be that. But in actual fact, what started to happen then um, was that in the mid-1890s, uh, the, 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 uh, the Federation conferences started to get uh, thousands upon thousands of signatures from Australians demanding that God be mentioned in the preamble. Wow. And it was getting to the point where the delegates could see that this was actually a really big issue at the popular level. And it was stated several times in the debates, and I know because I've, I've read the debates, it was stated several times that if we do not honour this, then you're going to have a lot of people who are going to vote against federation and we will not be able to federate. And this is all stated uh, in the actual Federation uh, documents and debates, which are all available online. And so the Christian sentiment at the popular level was incredibly strong. And that is something that really nowadays is not even controversial among historians. A great book on Federation that deals with these kinds of things was, was John Hurst's book, uh, The Sentimental Nation. And he opens that book with a line something like, God wanted Australia to be a federation, and the, 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 um, the religious impulse behind federation was actually quite strong, not just for many thousands of Australians, but for delegates uh, like, for example, uh, Sir Alfred Deakin, who would go on to become one of Australia's prime ministers. I mean, there's so much more to say, but uh, certainly it was a very strong impulse at the time. I, I'm fascinated. I, I could listen to you talk about this forever. Is this is this material in your book that you've just covered? The oh yeah, absolutely. Um, oh, man, I can't of, wait to get that. You have to come back good. on the show, please, when uh, when it's when it's launched and ready to be sold and promoted. Um, yeah, I'd love to, and I'm very grateful for that invitation. Uh, it sounds like such such uh, water for a, a thirsty soul uh, in this nation. We have drifted so far from from our christian foundation and and to the point that it's it's easy for a, an aggressive secularist to suggest that we had no sense of of christianity at all and the average person has has no framework or context to rebut that assertion um, which from what you're saying is ridiculous uh, we had a very sentimentally christian Christian nation at the time. That's, um, yeah, remarkable. Well, to, to Australia's best historians, the, the statement that religion made no impact on Australia and, and Australians were not religious, uh, you know, is about as credible as uh, the, a statement to the effect that the earth is flat um, would be to a science department. I mean, our best historians have always acknowledged that Christianity had a huge role to play in Australia. Mm. Uh, the problem is that that message has just not gotten out uh, beyond uh, some of the sort of thick tomes of history, but it, mm. but it is there. But I'm happy to say there are people now getting that message out there. Okay. But certainly, uh, Austra Austra I mean, the, the origins of Australia were not particularly auspicious religiously. And, and what happens is that people will say, well, look, in the earliest years, the convicts weren't all that religious. And look, there's probably some truth in that. For a lot of them, they weren't religious. Others were religious. But what people do is, is that they take the convict experience, which, re remember, 
is only sort of powerful up until sort of the mid 19th century. Uh, and only, again, only among convicts. Uh, and they take it and they project it on the whole of Australian colonial history and beyond, mm. forgetting that, you know, from very early on in Australian history, you had free settlers coming from um, England, uh, Wales and, and Scotland and, and Northern Ireland. And, and these people were very religious. And the first thing that these people did was build churches. And, and, mm. and this was something acknowledged by the early governors. So as you probably know, in 1836, Governor Burke says, well, look, you know, we really need to um, you know, make sure that Australians remain a religious people uh, because a religious people is a moral people and it's easier to govern people when they're moral. So what's the best way to do that? Well, I know. Let's set aside £30,000 from the New South Wales budget every year and build churches and pay clergymen to come to Australia. I had no exactly idea about that. That's amazing. That's exactly what they did. Mm. And that lasted in New South Wales until 1862. Uh, that, that lasted uh, in um, Western Australia until about 1890. Mm. Uh, these are things that are there for those you know, who take the time. And yeah, in this book that I'm, I'm writing with uh, Professor John Gascoigne and Dr. Ian Tregenza, we'll outline all of this. And um, I'd love to come back on the show and talk about it with you. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we might need an episode for every chapter. I, I, hope, <laughs> I only hope that the uh, viewers are coming with me because I'm a political nerd and a legal nerd without having studied any of those things uh, uh, full-time or professionally, if you can be a professional student, many can, and give it a good go. But I, I, could, them. <laughs> I, I could just, yeah, feast on this information and uh, knowledge all day long. Uh, you'll have to promise me, though, to do an audiobook version as well so I can listen to it and read it. <laughs> sure. um, <laughs> uh, and it has to be done in an Australian accent, of course. Don't, don't outsource that overseas. I'll, we'll Look, find a celebrity to do it. <laughs> uh, Andrew Bolt. John Howard. Oh, he's got a beautiful voice, uh, doesn't he? Maybe not. Maybe not uh, John Howard. But anyway, um, look, I, I don't know if this is jumping too far ahead in the trajectory of things that we want to do. I, I could camp here for a long time, but given how far we have drifted, especially in the last six months, uh, from the vision that our, our federation founding fathers had uh, from for the the culture and and Christian society um, that they wanted to protect and, and uh, codify. What w Section 116 certainly prevents the Commonwealth from, from establishing a religion and, and you know, making it too impositional, but are there any protections for the Commonwealth from abandoning that culture? What, what is to say that that the society now, 120 years hence, has, has not actually said, okay, well, we're no longer sentimentally Christian. Now mm. we're sentimentally sexually confused. Um, why don't we make that our new moral compass where if it feels good, do it, um, yeah. and, and feelings are, are the highest good instead of God's truth? Was there anything... What's to stop that from happening? What's to stop them from rejecting um, that foundational document? And is it important or relevant if they do? Well, the first thing is that, you know, although the, the Federation delegates believed that Australia was, you know, basically, you know, a Christian nation, owing to the fact that it was made up of Brits, at the same time, they weren't trying to legislate uh, a Christian nation. They, I mean, that's the thing about Section 116 as well. Um, yeah, it kind of presupposes that Australia is a Christian nation, uh, but at the same time, it does prevent any attempts to impose legally uh, Christianity on the nation. And so essentially what the, the Constitution does is it sort of lets the question of the religiosity of Australians remain in the private cultural sphere. And so what that means is that, you know, if culture drifts away from Christianity, which of course it has, uh, especially over the last sort of 50 years, mm -hmm. then the Constitution in, in, in many ways really has nothing to say one way or the other about that. Um, and I suppose increasingly the 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 
the, the uh, clause in the preamble or the statement in the preamble that you know, Australia is humbly relying on the blessing of Almighty God, that's looking increasingly quaint. Mm. Now, I would say the overwhelming majority of the Federation Fathers wouldn't have imagined that we would have become as secularized as we did. Some may have, uh, but this was not something that I think was anticipated by most of the, the Federation Fathers. And I, I guess one would have to say that the Constitution itself, enshrining religious liberty, you know, actually you know, permits this to happen. It's a cultural issue. It's something that, if it's ever going to be changed, is certainly not going to be changed uh, by the Constitution. It's something that needs to be changed at the popular level um, uh, by people living out and speaking out the Christian gospel in, in an authentic uh, in a, a sacrificial and persuasive way. Mm. And we, we always want to remember that at the end of the day, the job of, of creating a, a sort of a, a more gospel-centric uh, community is, at the end of the day, it's the job of the church. Uh, it's the job of Christians. It's not the job of the state, mm. which isn't to say that the state can't in some ways encourage it, uh, but the state can't just effect that. Mm. Um, that can't be done. And I agree with that. I, yep. I don't know of any denomination or serious Christian of, of any uh, significant scholarship who would suggest that we should be creating a, a theocracy where where we make God our, our supreme monarch and and you know have have the dark days of, of where corrupt men in political power in religion then wielded that influence further for corruption and, and greed. In, in the affairs of men, I, I, I do oh. like the separation of that um, of for, the, for the mutual protection of, of each of them. But it seems to me that there's uh, a secularism growing that seems to not be inclusive secularism, where there's no favor regarded for anybody's worldview, but they're actually now seeming to promote an exclusive secularism where if you have a, a faith or a spiritual worldview or religious conviction, then that is the only worldview which is invalid and unwelcome and almost illegal. We're now seeing uh, anti-discrimination tribunals set up in the name of, of good things which are effectively quite um, prejudicial and bigoted against those people that have the religious convictions which our nation was founded upon. This is exactly right, David. I mean, you raise a good point earlier. Of course, you know, we all, you know, we all reject theocracy. <laughs> a mm. Theocracy defined as, you know, you could define it, so, I mean, I mean, the, the word, of course, literally means the rule of God. Um, but, you know, we all reject the notion, for example, that, you know, uh, religious priests or the state should exist to take a particular dogmatic form of religion and enforce it on the people, like you know Henry the Eighth did, like Edward the mm. Sixth did, like Mary the First did, uh, like Elizabeth the First did, like you know, like the kings and the queens did. I and mean, of course, we all reject that. The problem is, and you've touched on this very nicely, uh, sort of secularist critics of Christians who would like to see more Christian influence uh, in politics and, and, and lobbying, they take that and they say, oh, you're trying to establish a, a, a theocracy, uh, which is a ridiculous accusation to make because mm. all Christians are trying to do is exercise the same kind of right, the same kind of right driven by goodwill uh, that, for example, trade unionists want to exercise or, for example, that other kinds of lobby groups want to exercise. They believe that there is a particular, you know, vision of a well-ordered society, and they would like to try to influence politics to, to see that uh, obtain. Mm. And Christians are no different from anyone else. Although when Christians try to do it, you get, again, fairly, you get fairly ideological secularists who say, oh, that's just theocracy. Uh, but it's not. And, and that is a, is a kind of a way of just dismissing um, and delegitimizing, uh, as you say, you know, not, not even just not even just sort of Christians in politics uh, doing politics Christianly, mm. but even Christians just having a public opinion a lot of the time. Mm. And so, you know, you get people sort of saying to the Australian Christian lobby, which has no direct, you know, constitutional, legal, political power whatsoever, basically saying, oh, you, you guys have no right to exist. 
because you're forcing your opinions on everyone else and we have a separation of church and state. Mm. You know, a total misunderstanding mm. of sort of historic meaning of separation of church and state. Uh, you know, in, in Australia, the actual historical meaning of separation of church and state is the state ceasing its financial support of the churches by building churches at its own cost and paying the stipends of clergymen. In wow. Australian history, that's what the term means. Now, it has a slightly broader meaning in Australian history as well, which is essentially uh, religious freedom. So the state not favoring one particular religion over another uh, to the detriment of, of the other. Now, that's another sort of meaning that exists uh, as well. Uh, but for the most part, you know, separation of church and state uh, you know, it certainly had nothing to do with silencing religious voices. And this is sort of part of the illiberalism of the new definition of secular, which has emerged, you know, really fairly recently in Australian history, really only over the last sort of 40 or 50 years. Um, and yeah, this is a real problem. And, and so what we actually need to do now bizarrely, is to make a case that you know, just because you are a religious voice or that your convictions might spring from you know, a religious font, therefore you still have a right to be able to even just, even just speak publicly. And, and, and so we've got this very bizarre view that just voicing a Christian opinion is sort of imposing your views on someone else. So someone is being imposed on if they can just hear your voice. An utterly bizarre, strange idea, mm. but it is an idea that's very, very prevalent. Mm. And that's something that we need to really expose uh, for the nonsense and sort of anti-democratic uh, accusation that it is. Now, last year, there was a, a particularly shrill homosexual activist on Twitter who used his voice and imposed his views on uh, members of, of Australian public life uh, to effectively silence them and literally destroy their careers. Uh, mm. There was uh, one gentleman who, was, because of his association with the Australian Christian Lobby and specifically the, the board of the Lachlan Macquarie internship, um, that he was chased out of his job with, uh, I think it was firstly Price Waterhouse Coopers and then IBM and and they were demanding that if these organisations subscribed to the marriage equality lobby as they did corporately, then they should reject anybody from their employ who actually disagreed with the political lobby. They then came after you and chased uh, the Macquarie University that you, that you work for and you teach at to silence and censure, if not to fire you completely um, because of your, again, association with uh, the Lachlan Macquarie internship and, and the Australian Christian Lobby. Just tell us a little bit about that, the legality of it, the, the uh, social implications of it, and the political implications of it. Well, I, I mean, in, in my case, the suggestion made, I mean, the, the exact tweet that was directed at me and, and Macquarie University was that uh, it's a bad look for Macquarie University to have Stephen Chavura on its payroll. And that was because, as you say, I am a, uh, a, a member of the board of the Lachlan Macquarie Institute, mm -hmm. um, uh, which seeks to train uh, Christians to go into areas of public leadership, whether that's business, law, politics, or culture more broadly. And this was seen as something that was somehow at odds with Macquarie University's ethic of diversity. And so the obvious intention uh, of this tweeter was to somehow jeopardize my dual association with both Macquarie University and the Lachlan Macquarie Institute, i.e. I couldn't be a part of both at once, hmm. uh, which is, you know, a, a sort of an assault against my freedom of association and in another way, an assault against freedom of speech. And, and what it really points to is the really insidious nature of this new ethic that has emerged, you know, especially over the last sort of 20 years, this diversity ethic, or I call it a mm. diversity cult. Mm. Yeah. Um, and, and essentially what it seeks to do, 
is... Peter, Peter Curti from the uh, Centre for Independent Studies calls it a fetish for diversity. Yeah, I mean, it, look, it's, it's all of those things. But mm. at the end of the day, it's a kind of fanaticism mm. that seeks to cleanse social institutions of those whose views doesn't cohere with sort of the sacred cows of, of um, this sort of diversity uh, cult, this diversity fetish. It, it's also sort of known you know, as identity politics, which is not a term that should be laughed at. It is something that actually exists. And essentially what it seeks to do is remove any voices that would uh, uphold uh, traditional views of marriage, of sexuality, Mm -hmm. uh, remove any voices that may be critical of sort of sacred cows like multiculturalism, for example. And it, it basically uh, seeks to uh, sort of rebuild sort of the, the intellectual scaffolding of public institutions from the ground up based on um, what could be known as identity politics. And, and what mm -hmm. identity politics basically is, is that it's a, it's a form of politics which sort of singles out certain uh, social groups uh, based on uh, past mistreatment at the hands of principally, you know, white Christian heterosexual males. Mm -hmm. So if you don't fit into that category, if you're not white sort of Christian heterosexual male, then you make a really good candidate for a member of, an, of, of sort of, a, of an identity politics group mm -hmm. or a victim group. Mm -hmm. And so these groups are made up of uh, people of, in the LGBTQ community, uh, women, uh, you know, ethnic, uh, racial, cultural minorities, and that kind of thing. And essentially what identity politics seeks to do is it seeks to cleanse society of any language, uh, any practices that would make members from these identity groups feel excluded feel offended, feel uncomfortable. Uh, and so it's very important in identity politics to make sure that certain ideas uh, remain um, contained, like you would contain a disease, and certainly that certain words uh, are not uttered. And so the, the obvious example of the control of language is what's going on with you know, Jordan Peterson over the last sort of year. Mm and this attempt to enforce sort of gender neutral pronouns and to sort of legislate and make them compulsory to use. And this is what's been going on in, in Canada and things like that. But that's a yeah. classic, that's a classic uh, strategy of identity politics, because if you can control language, then you can sort of control thought. And if you can control thought, then you can control how people think about things like sexual gender identity, marriage, race, culture and things like that. And so that's why identity politics is so fanatical about, A, removing people from institutions who think the wrong way, and B, controlling public language uh, in such a way that enables their kind of diversity utopia to sort of take root. But of course, this diversity utopia is really just a, a, a sort of an enforced imposed uniformity where basically everyone has to think the same. Mm. There's a widely accepted implied freedom of political communication in the Australian Constitution. However, I'm entirely sceptical that it's of any use at all. Um, and maybe I'm a tad cynical and maybe it's, it's well applied uh, in some cases recently. But I see very little benefit and application of it. These anti-discrimination tribunals and the, the protection of, of certain attributes of, of these uh, intersectional victim groups, um, they seem to trump implied, implied uh, rights and explicit yeah. rights, um, such as freedom of religion and freedom of political yes. communication. Uh, yeah. and, and of course... Uh, you know the the leftists will will point to the occasional um, case where it's been abandoned, such as Julian Porteous in Tasmania, and say, "See, nothing happened." Uh, but in the meantime, there there is this silencing, muting effect on public debate in Australia out of fear of being hauled before these arduous and expensive uh, 
stressful and emotionally expensive um, processes where the process itself has become the punishment and the implied yeah. freedom in the constitution is of very little comfort to those people who find themselves on the wrong end of a of a lawfare action by a um, activist um, leftist. Yeah. Well, I mean, what's sort of happened um, in Australia over the last sort of 20, 30 years, and again, it sort of coincides with this rise of identity politics, is that traditional liberal rights, you know, especially freedom of speech, are sort of being seen with the same kind of suspicion that Marxists saw a traditional liberal right like freedom of property. Mm. And this is, again, this is sort of part of the Marxist strain in mm. identity politics. I mean, ultimately, if you want to know what identity politics is, it's very much um, the philosophy of Michel Foucault, which tended to see all relationships in society as sort of power struggles. And Michel Foucault was very heavily influenced by two 19th century philosophers, Friedrich Nietzsche and Karl Marx. Uh, Nietzsche was this kind of nihilist who said that sort of ultimate values don't really exist and, and, and socially we're abandoning them. And that's what he meant when he said God is dead. Mm -hmm. And if you add that kind of nihilism to Karl Marx's uh, understanding of history as one group struggling against another, if you sort of splice those together, you kind of wind up with, a, with, with sort of the identity politics that we have today. And so nowadays, when people mention sort of freedom of speech, it sort of has this connotation, oh, that's just a, that's just a right for, you know, wealthy, white, heterosexual men. And it's something that they use to keep everyone else down. It's something they use to put down Muslims. It's something they use to put down gays. It's something they use to criticize transgenderism. It's something they use to make misogynist comments about women. Again, it's seen in the same way that Marxists mm. historically saw private property as really a kind of a sham and something that's really just for the rich to use to be able to exploit the poor. And this is a really tragic thing mm. because freedom of speech is actually one of the most important social goods that's ever been stumbled upon in the history of civilization uh, because freedom of speech allows us not just to hold the government accountable, but it, hold, it allow, allows us to hold our fellow citizens accountable. And if you get rid of freedom of speech, then you can no longer speak out against a government that's abusing the rights of its citizens, mm. but also you can't speak out against fellow citizens who would seek to use the state to silence those with whom they agree. Mm. And this was John, Stuart's Mill, John Stuart Mill's great point in his classic 1859 book on liberty. You see, for John Stuart Mill, the great danger to freedom of speech was not so much the state. It wasn't so much the state. <laughs> it was society. It was other people who would seek to silence their fellow citizens um, uh, in all sorts of ways by sort of socially excluding them and those kinds of things. Uh, and for, for John Stuart Mill, the great threat to freedom was actually sort of social coercion. And this is kind of the era that we're heading into now where a lot of, where although, you know, freedom of speech may for the most part sort of be enshrined in common law traditions and things like that, um, there's a kind of ideological social pressure which is stopping people's ability to enjoy their freedom of speech by imposing all sorts of social costs. A great example of that was the Cooper's Brewery affair. Oh, uh, okay. You had Andrew Hastie and Tim Wilson sitting down for a, a fairly innocuous, friendly conversation on same-sex marriage. Mm. And some you know, uh, LGBT protesters thought, well, this is a disgusting thing to take place. How could you even debate the question of same-sex marriage, and they basically went to social media and tried to destroy the reputation of the Cooper's Brewery because of this. And of course, Cooper's Brewery, you know, withdrew its support of the, um, you know, of the discussion, and the whole thing sort of fell down, fell apart, and the discussion, you know, that was the end of the whole thing. Issued the and hostage video. Well, that's right. That that video, uh, you know, of of the owners of the Cooper's Brewery, yeah, looking yeah. like they were literally sort of hostages, and and this is the kind of thing that is starting to go on. Um, you know, I mean, 
freedom of speech was something that most Australians tended to value once upon a time, even to the point where Menzies found it impossible to ban the Communist Party. He couldn't do it at the end of the day uh, because more, more than 50% of Australians believed that even though the Communist Party is potentially very dangerous, they still have the right to speak and assemble together. And he lost that in the 1950s. But nowadays, freedom of speech is starting to see, be seen, particularly by the younger generation, as a kind of quaint, old-fashioned, um, almost uh, right, almost held in suspicion. And that's really, really problematic because the only people who aren't really concerned for the health of freedom of speech are people who themselves plan on controlling other people's speech or people who have no thoughts of their own that they want one day to speak. That's no society that I want to live in. Yeah, look, it seems to me that this has all gone wrong in, in one place. And maybe I'm asking this rhetorically and, and being simplistic as well. Of, of course, many things need to, to change. The, the morality of the society needs to improve. The, the, the politicians need to value our history as well as our future. But it seems to me that the judge's job is to, is to actually protect uh, the abuse and, and the departure from the Constitution, the ab abuse of the, the courts, for, for frivolous and revisionist um, lawfare and weaponization of these things. So we're all in favor of equal rights and imago dei, everybody being equal under the law, justice being blind. But in the creation of our equal rights commissioners and human rights commissioners and, and anti-discrimination tribunals, we've seen them weaponized. And, mm. and it seems to me that those people who've been appointed, and especially the judges, who see these cases coming forward should be able to say, look, that's, that was never the intention of the law. That was never the intention of the Constitution to exclude Christianity and to ultimately reduce down to the ridiculous notion that freedom is a tool of oppression. So where, where did we go wrong? Where did this all start unraveling? Can we, can we point simplistically to something like judges and say, hey, you guys have started being revisionist instead of faithful to the original intent. Well, it's, it's really a cultural problem that um, in the 19th century, Christianity is seen as not just true, but also profoundly socially useful. Uh, it's seen as the foundation of morality and belief in God is, is considered the, you know, the foundation of morality, uh, this is and, and that idea is sort of you know is intrinsic to Christianity, and it, it's something that uh, you know one of the original uh, uh, theorists of the separation of church and state and, and the secular state, John Locke, pointed out in uh, in, in 1689-1690 in his letter concerning toleration. He said, "Look, you know, God is the foundation of, of morality, and therefore we shouldn't." you know, tolerate atheists in public office and things like that. Now, of course, we're not arguing that anymore, but the point is, yep. up until very recently in history, I don't know. religion and, and, and Christianity <laughs> in particular, and Christianity in particular, were, were not just seen as true, but they were seen as very, very moral, and mm. therefore the state ought to protect them. Mm. But what starts to happen in the 20th century, and this is a very difficult, complex story to tell, and we're not even too sure exactly what did happen. Mm. But certainly, if we can just start, for example, in the 1960s, what starts to happen is that Christian morality starts to become less and less uh, sort of in touch with what is going on at the social level. Mm. Uh, a, a great revolution happens at the beginning of the 1960s, and that's uh, the, uh, the pill which really for the first time in history effectively separates sexual activity, the male-female sexual activity, mm -hmm. from, uh, from children. Mm -hmm. And so sort of for the first time in history, you can be very sexually active and you don't have to worry about getting pregnant. Mm -hmm. Now, what that actually does is it doesn't just change sexual morality and sort of make quaint and strange the idea that you know, you know, you shouldn't have sex with multiple people because you'll wind up with children from multiple partners. Mm -hmm. 
uh, but it also changes our understanding of marriage over time. You see, marriage up until the 1960s as an institution made perfect sense. It was a common sense institution because if you're going to have sex, you're going to have children. And if you're going to have children, you need some kind of stable economic structure within which to bring them up. Uh, it, it, it was, so Christian morality was considered just common sense. Mm. But with technological change in the 1960s and the sort of social change that that brings about, that brings about a new kind of sexual liberationism which divorces social morality from traditional Christianity. And that new sexual liberationism doesn't just affect sort of the way we think about male-female sexual relations and marriage. It also affects the way we think about homosexuality. And so homosexuality uh, in this sort of shaking up of traditional sexual notions and in, in, in the liberation of sex, of sex in the 1960s, homosexuality itself becomes something that's far more acceptable. And so that just a little bit more, maybe even a lot more, separate social morality from traditional Christian morality. Now, where am I going with this? Well, the point is that once upon a time, Christian morality was seen as common sense. It was seen as just morality. But after the 1960s, and especially today, it's actually now seen as immorality. Hmm. Social morality has so moved away from traditional Christian notions hmm. of sex, sexuality, now gender, the meaning of marriage, that traditional Christian notions of these things are now seen as oppressive, they're seen as bigoted. Mm. And so consequently, um, uh, Christianity itself is now by many people seen as a kind of, frankly, a kind of social disease that needs to be contained um, because it is so far removed uh, from the way that many Australians think about things like sex, sexuality, and marriage now. And that, of course, was very nicely demonstrated in the recent same-sex marriage uh, debate that we had in Australia. And so, you know, this is what's happened. And so, you know, th th this is a massive, massive cultural issue which has emerged from a cultural shift that took place, um, you know, over some decades uh, that we're dealing with now. And so... It's really a question of how the church can and how Christians can exist and live in such a way that we can convince the prevailing culture or at least enough people in the prevailing culture mm. that in actual fact what happened in the 1960s was a wrong turn. Mm. You know, it, it actually has not led to a sexual morality which is to the benefits of human flourishing, which is a sexual morality that is making people happier. Mm. Um, and in actual fact, there's probably good evidence to suggest that it hasn't made people happier at all. You know, divorces are up, uh, children are growing up without fathers, yep. uh, you know, you know, far more than what they were you know, prior uh, to this sort of sexual revolution. Uh, and this is a real social problem. And, and it's something, I mean, you know, law, I mean, the relationship between law, politics and, and culture and society, it, it, it's not a sort of top down or bottom up relationship at all. Uh, there's this statement that says sort of politics is sort of downstream from culture, but even that's too simplistic. You see, politics affects culture, but culture also affects politics. And, and things like the law, politics and culture, they're all in a kind of dialogue with one another, changing one another all the time. And that's why we need Christians uh, who sort of have their finger on the cultural pulse, who understand history, mm. who understand present day ideas and who are interested in engaging with present-day cultural ideas, but also at another level are also interested in going into politics and going into law and trying to be influential in that dialogue that takes place between law, politics, and culture to try to bring about you know, some good policy and some good legislation. And by good policy and good legislation, I think what we mean is the same thing in some ways that, that sort of secular folk mean, policy and legislation that facilitates a happier, more just society. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. And and, and to, I bring it back to the finger of accusation that I pointed at the judiciary. My my frustration is that they seem to be following culture, and their decisions of the judges seem to be based more on the outcomes that they want to see in culture, 
having been led by culture perhaps, um, rather than being faithful interpretations of the law and the constitution. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's a frustration. Uh, it, yeah, it seems I, I to me that that's it seems to me that that's failing their job, and we should have some mechanism by which to depose of judges who fail to properly uphold the original intent of of the the laws that have been made. Well, I would certainly. Uh, I mean, I mean, I think that what I would like to see. I mean, I won't speak so much of judges because that's not really my area. Area, but certainly we we do have sort of. Um, uh, you know, you know, state uh, bureaucrats and office holders in, in offices like sort of anti-discrimination tribunals, uh, so anti-discrimination uh, boards, human mm-hmm. rights uh, boards and things like that, who have basically forsaken uh, the traditional sort of classical liberal approach that Australia has had to freedom of speech, freedom of association, who've really forsaken that. Mm. And are very much driven by again what we do call identity politics, mm. uh, and I, I would I, I think that that needs to be continuously uh, exposed for the very insidious influence that it's having that it can potentially have on on public debate. And you mentioned earlier the Bishop Porteous case. I mean that was an absurd case where yeah. you had a bishop yeah. who wrote a leaflet that was distributed among schools basically arguing for the classical case for marriage. And this is a leaflet that was considered so offensive and so pernicious by some activists that they actually took him to an anti-discrimination tribunal. And the only reason that that that, that process ended was because the person who made the complaint dropped it. Hmm. But it would have kept going, and who knows what the outcome would have been. Yeah, uh, it, it seems it, the Tasmanian anti-discrimination tribunal is a joke. Uh, and you know that that complaint should have been dismissed out of hand. Uh, it it should have never made anybody's in tray or anything. It should have been come off it. He's a pastor teaching pastorally things that the church has taught for two thousand years. You have no valid complaint. Well, see, this is the problem with identity politics. You see, traditional sort of classical liberal approaches to freedom of speech will say that yeah, there is some speech that should be limited. It should be banned. And so, for example, speech that incites violence should be banned. And, and even some you know, liberal thinkers will say, you know, severely, severely abusive, obscene speech directed at a particular person should not be allowed. So if someone literally comes up to your face in the street and just screams the most vile obscenity mm. to you, then you should perhaps be able to have them charged with some kind of harassment or something. Mm. But the problem with identity politics is that it cannot distinguish sort of reasonable critique and reasonable satire mm. from the kind of incendiary, abusive, sort of fighting words talk that classical liberalism used to be able to identify. And so with identity politics, there's almost no distinction between, you know, saying to, you know, saying just broadly in, in a newspaper article, in a, in a newspaper cartoon, in a leaflet, you know, I reject same-sex marriage. Uh, it's going to be really detrimental to society. The traditional Christian way is probably the best way for everyone. There's no distinction between that and just coming out and abusing uh, members of the LGBT community with vile, hmm. threatening hateful language. Yeah. They would de- they, many of them would de- define Porteous's leaflet in the same way that traditional classical liberal theorists would describe um, sort of fighting words, the same way you know, words that you know, involved you know, gross a- a- abuse. Mm. Um, and, they, and, and the problem is that there's, we're losing the distinction between those two kinds of things. And so, for example, you're getting people saying that, well, you know, criticizing Islam, you know, is, is a form of violence. It's a form of verbal violence. Mm. You know, criticizing the transgender uh, ideology is a form of sort of verbal violence. Mm. Uh, criticizing um, same-sex marriage is a form of verbal violence. Mm. And that is the really pernicious influence of identity politics on the way that we think about free speech. And it basically says that speech that is offensive, it says, well, it's a form of violence. 
And of course, we would all want violence. I mean, violence is something that the state should be concerned with. Yep. The problem is they define violence so broadly mm. that, again, if you say anything that isn't conducive uh, to the ideology of the diversity cult, uh, then you are considered violent. Yep. And that's the problem with identity politics. Um. So how long until your book is, is launched and uh, have you got a title for it yet? Well, the, the book is about 80% written. Uh, we're currently looking for a publisher and we'll find one eventually. The title of the book uh, will be A Secular State? Question mark, Reason, Religion and the Australian Polity. And I'm, I'm pretty sure it'll come out in 2019. Oh, but so little- long away. Well, the, the, well, that's the bad news, but the good mm. news is that little bits and pieces of it will come out along the way in terms of sort of opinion pieces, journal articles and things like that. So, you know, I'm certainly hoping to continue sort of writing for papers like The Australian. Uh, I'd like to uh, get one or two things in other fora like uh, the ABC Religion and Ethics Online and also maybe even The Conversation. And th- so it will start appearing, but I mean, if, if anyone wants to sort of uh, see some of what I've written uh, and what I've written with other with other scholars on some of these issues, then you can go to my academia.com website and all of my most of my publications are there for free uh, for you to access. So it's all available there. But otherwise, do uh, uh, do hang out for that book. <laughs> we'll get the link off you and, and make sure that's uh, beneath this video in the uh, in the details um, right. because we want people to be able to access that, and not have to wait till 2019. Um, I can't wait to read that book. Uh, Dr. St- Stephen, Stephen Shavura, thank you very much for uh, your time today. It's uh, been fascinating and, and these issues need exploring extensively. But most of all, thank you very much for the, the work that you're doing in fighting to preserve and maintain uh, that Christian influence, that moral influence for the good of our society in up-and-coming lawyers and uh, political leaders in Australia. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. It's been great being on your show. That's Dr. Stephen Shavura, and the links for his contact details and the material that he's written on this topic are available beneath the video now. And uh, please share it, make it uh, widely known that uh, the origins of Australia are not purely convict and atheistic. They're actually steeped in a sentimental value of uh, Christian ethic and morality and uh, we definitely are a culturally Christian nation both in origin and um, you know our very sincere hope is is in our future as well uh, no matter how far we've currently departed Uh, and to support the work of Pelo Talk and uh, this information source for people trying to provide an alternate media uh, origin please head to davepello.com where you'll be able to subscribe to newsletter updates, see past episodes and also support financially for as little as $3 a month or any amount once off. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in the next episode and if I don't see you again in another episode before Christmas, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. 